This is Health Call Online, the place for extended versions of interviews you hear on our weekly radio broadcast, the Health Call Radio Hour, now heard on more stations around the country through national syndication. I am glad you are here. You know, we as a society are facing just a serious crisis with Alzheimer's as all of us baby boomers age into our 80s and 90s. The social and economic cost of caring for this terrible disease it's going to be overwhelming. So we pay a lot of attention to that here on the program. And that's why something caught my attention that I want to share with you. I saw an, an article in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition hinting that Alzheimer's could be the result of, of our bodies going wrong in an evolutionary survival mechanism that leads to the neurological damage that results in Alzheimer's. Fascinating. So I reached out to the lead author on this project. He is Richard J. Johnson, MD. He's professor of medicine at the Division of Renal Diseases and Hypertension, the University of Colorado's Anschultz Medical Campus in beautiful Aurora. Doc, thanks for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Let me see if I understand the big picture here. It sounds as though our high sugar diets are leading our bodies down a path that causes neuroinflammation because our bodies are trying to get back into a survival mechanism that we developed billions of years ago, well, millions of years ago, when we were hunter-gatherers. Is that the bottom line here? <laughs> sort of. Yes, it's very similar to that. So yes, I think you're on the right track. <laughs> okay, let's walk that forward a little bit. So the, the key villain here, according to your paper, is fructose. Now, fructose is a form of sugar. What do I need to know about fructose? Okay, so let's just uh, start with the basics. There's two major sugars. There's glucose, which is the prim primary sugar in our blood, and uh, it's used as the it's the principal carbohydrate that we use for our fuel. And when the mm -hmm. glucose is high, we call it diabetes. When the glucose is low, we call it hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. And a lot of foods have glucose or starch in them. And so we're eating, we're getting a fair amount of glucose in our diet. Uh, but there's another sugar, and that sugar is called fructose. And fructose is sweeter than glucose. And when the two are combined, you get this thing called table sugar <laughs> or high fructose corn syrup. So high fructose corn syrup is really a mixture of glucose and fructose. And fruits also contain fructose, and we think of fruits as healthy. But it turns out that fructose in high concentrations um, can really create great havoc for us. And what it does is uh, it actually is distinct from all other nutrients in that it can uh, stimulate uh, hunger, uh, appetite foraging, uh, and, and it can activate a biologic process that can lead to obesity. Uh, this was uh, quite an interesting story, how we discovered it. But in essence, fructose uh, turns out to be used by animals in nature to try to, for example, to, to gain weight uh, before a crisis. So it's actually was meant to be a survival benefit. And so like a classic example is the uh, bear that wants to hibernate mm -hmm. uh, through winter. You know, uh, winter's coming. There's not going to be so much food around. And so the, the bear has to prepare for the hibernation by putting on fat because when it hibernates, it will burn the fat as its fuel. So fat, when it's burning, when you burn it, actually can generate fuel. And when they eat all that fruit, uh, the, they get a fair amount of fructose, and it activates this switch that makes them hungry, forage for food, start gaining weight. They become they can't control their appetite, uh, and they they develop insulin resistance and fatty liver and all the things that we call metabolic syndrome is really what uh, these animals do to prepare for for winter. And uh, and it uh, turns out that, that um, the way the fructose works is very unique to, to fructose. It, it tricks the body into, think, into thinking it's hungry. And it does it by reducing the energy we, current, we actively use. So it reduces well, the energy. For, yeah. Let me, let me stop you there. So see if I can take that apart. So your contention is that our, the, the availability of sugar in everything, I mean, high fructose corn syrup is all over the place, 
Uh, and, and not only that, but high glycemic foods, very starchy carbohydrates, their bodies convert to sugar, forces us into this survival mechanism, this hibernation mode, and we just live there all the time. How is that damaging our brain? Yeah. So, uh, so let's just talk about this. So the way the, the switch works is, you know, normally when you eat food, you use it to generate energy. And mm -hmm. we, we have two kinds of energy. We have the energy that we actively use, and that has a special name. It's called ATP. And then there's an energy that we, if, it's, if we have excessive energy, we can store it. And the principal way we store energy is to make fat. So if you think about total energy, it's sort of fat plus the ATP we have. And it's the ATP that's in us that we use to run and walk and talk and do everything we do. So when we eat food, we're using it to produce ATP. And that extra energy kind of gets spilled over into fat if we don't okay. use it. Well, that's the way we were thinking it worked. But it's actually a little bit trickier. What fructose does is a trick. And it, you know, the ATP are, are made in a place that we call them energy factories or mitochondria. And our mitochondria are making all of this energy for us um, in the form of ATP. What fructose does is it suppresses the, the mitochondria from making ATP. So there's less ATP made. So we have less active energy. So our active energy drops by like 30 or 40% when we drink a soft drink, for example. And when that active energy drops, the food we're eating gets converted into fat right away because, because uh, the, the active energy is suppressed. And so the food has to go to, to some form of energy. So it goes into the fat. And so, uh, and, and there's also a block in the ability of the fat to release the energy back to the ATP. So what happens is it's a low ATP state. And it's that low ATP state that turns out to be uh, playing a role in how Alzheimer's, uh, we think Alzheimer's develops. So our brain is the heaviest consumer of energy in our body. It's thought that the brain consumes about 20% of our total energy output, even though you know your brain is only three pounds of your total body weight or so. So you're saying that uh, we're starving the brain of energy by all of this fructose intake? Well, let, let me uh, take you through this, you, you know, and actually maybe, I don't know, Lee, maybe it's better if we just talk about what we know about Alzheimer's and how yeah. we've discovered this pathway connected to Alzheimer's. Okay. So, you know, so as everyone knows, Alzheimer's is one of the worst diseases you can get. It's devastating for the patient. It's devastating for the family. It's the sixth most common cause of death. Mm -hmm. It's increasing because we're getting older, but even for the same age, there's evidence that it's increasing. It seems to be, you know, really, really scary uh, disease that's uh, increasing. We don't know the cause. Now, when Alzheimer first described it, basically he said, well, you know, what we see is a sh shrunk brain, an atrophied brain. The brain shrinks and uh, loses it, the neurons, which are the key things that we need for thinking. You know, it's our key, the key aspect of the brain are the neurons. And when he looked, he found that there were these plaques of amyloid and these, uh, this protein called tau protein that was accumulating in the neurons. And for the last 50 years, mm -hmm. we have thought of Alzheimer's as really a disease due to the amyloid plaques. And so everyone has been going after the amyloid plaques. Can we find a way to block the amyloid plaques? Well, we now have two new medications that have been approved. They're monoclonal right. antibodies that are supposedly attack and remove those things, but they're not having a significant effect and they're coming right. at very high cost. Right, exactly. So there were over 20 different drugs that went to market, two made it, yeah. uh, and they just show bare, barely significant effects, and they have a lot of side effects. Yeah. So people start thinking, you know, maybe, maybe the disease, you know, maybe these amyloid plaques are kind of, they come at the end of the disease, and, and there's something that's initiating it. And by treating the amyloid plaques, we're not getting to the underlying cause. So the, the amyloid plaques might be the brain. I've read that a theory is these amyloid plaques and the tau tangles are a defensive mechanism 
that the brain is putting forward, the, the immune system is putting forward to protect itself against these other factors. Yeah, it's possible that it could be that. And so what, 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 what we do know is that there's some earlier features that pre precede the amyloid plaques. And there's, there's three things that have been identified. One is that there seems to be um, a problem with the mitochondria. The energy factories start making less ATP. There's some kind of suppression going on of those mitochondria where they're making less ATP. And you can even sometimes see little fat vacuoles as well. So it seems like there's, it's, not use, the, it's not making ATP the way it's supposed to. The second thing that we see is that there's the development of insulin resistance in the brain. Hmm. And although some regions of the brain don't require insulin, a lot of areas do, and they become resistant to the effects. And what that means is that glucose, the main fuel, can't get into those brain cells as easily because so, insulin is used to bring glucose right. in as a fuel. So there's less fuel for the neurons. So they're not getting enough neuro, uh, they're not getting enough energy, and they're making less ATP. And the third one is that there's a low grade inflammation that occurs, mm -hmm. and and this has led people to say, okay, look, with the insulin resistance in the brain, let's give insulin through the no nostrils. Let's try to give it through the nose and see if we can get insulin in the brain to help. Or let's try to block inflammation with this monoclonal. Or let's try to, uh, you know, try to stimulate the mitochondria somehow. But again, it seems like they're treating the consequence, you know, what's going on mm -hmm. rather than they don't really know what's causing this. And what's fantastic is um, our hypothesis basically lays out how this whole thing happens. Yeah, it's a, it's a complex biochemical process that we're not going to get into here because it's way over my head. Uh, but the bottom line is you're kind of describing diabetes of the brain is what it sounds like. Yes. In fact, it's sometimes called diabetes of the brain. So this is how we, we kind of came upon this. So we were studying this met pathway where animals use fructose to, to become obese and they become insulin resistant. When you, when you eat fructose, you can induce insulin resistance and you can induce obesity, not only in animals, but in people. And, you, and another big finding was that we discovered that the body can make fructose. So it isn't just the sugar you're eating, uh, but things like high glycemic carbs, like uh, rice, mm -hmm. potatoes, uh, you know, and uh, and salty foods can all act to increase fructose production. So now we, we found that when animals were eating a lot of glycemic carbs, they were making fructose, and this was driving a, a drop in ATP, insulin resistance, and actually low-grade inflammation. So here I am, I'm not a neurologist, and I go, wait, fructose causes low ATP, it's the only nutrient that does. It causes uh, you know, neural. It causes inflammation and it causes insulin resistance. This is what we see in the brain of patients with Alzheimer's. So we started looking and we go, you know what? Actually, eating sugar is associated with increased risk for Alzheimer's. Eating high fructose corn syrup is associated with an increased risk for Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. and also these foods that make fructose like high glycemic carbs and salty food by gosh they can increase the risk for alzheimer's and obesity which is driven by fructose and diabetes they increase the risk so we have an epidemiologic link right yeah. so so then we gave fructose to animals or and actually um, the, a lot of these were done by other other groups but if you give fructose to animals guess what happens after about six weeks, the animals start having trouble remembering things. Like you can put the, the, the laboratory rat into a maze and it will, you know, find its way right. through the maze yeah. and you can time how long it gets through there. And a normal rat, each time it goes through, it d does it a little bit faster. You know, mm -hmm. they, they mm -hmm. learn. But if you give them sugar or high fructose corn syrup, they don't learn. They, they continue to take a long time to get through the maze. So we know that they're having some 
what we call cognitive dysfunction, some yeah. problems with thinking. And then uh, when you look in their brain, you find a drop in ATP in the cells. You find low uh, suppression of these energy factors. We find insulin resistance and we find neuroinflammation. And if you keep giving sugar, over time, they start getting amyloid plaques and tau protein. So it seems okay. like it's very likely the mechanism, right? Yeah, it's yeah. showing the whole pathway. Yeah. Then if you look at patients with Alzheimer's and you measure fructose levels in their brain, they're high. They're mm. high. So all these things sort of fit. So we go, oh, my gosh, could it be diet? It probably is diet. And so um, what, I, what I tell you is, you know, that doesn't mean don't ever eat sugar. Don't ever eat bread or anything like that. It's all about excessive intake. It's excessive intake. So, you know, please eat, have a cake on your birthday. You know, you know, I'm telling you, you know, that you don't have to completely restrict this, but I'm telling you that eating, you know, hamburgers every day and ice cream and cake all the time will increase your risk for developing this disease. Yeah, you know, that makes so much sense. And and so much of our diet, the grab-and-go diets that so many of us live on today are predominantly high in fat and sugars and carbohydrates. Right. Those are inexpensive things that we've all come to love. Yep. And so I get it how this could all spin into this epidemic of Alzheimer's. So you just said, you know, you're not a neurologist. What are the neuro guys? They got to, what are they saying about this? Are they Are they accepting of your theory? Well, one of the great rules in, in research is if you go into an area where you're not an expert, you find experts in the field and you present your hypothesis and you discuss it with them and you, you get their feedback. And so on the paper, I mean, I'm delighted and honored that David Perlmutter, who's a famous neurologist, wrote The Grain Brain and he's written about uric acid. And he's an author, Dale Bredesen, who's been doing dietary studies and in patients with Alzheimer's and he's an author and Maria Nagel, who's a superb NIH funded researcher on Alzheimer's. She's an author. And, and in fact, we're, we're now doing research in this area and it's very, very exciting, but I'll tell you the, 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 the coolest uh, evidence. This is, I think this is the coolest evidence. Um, you know, so I told you that this switch, um, you know, drops ATP uh, mm -hmm. in cells, right? And and that characterizes Alzheimer's. But what's really interesting is Alzheimer's tends to affect certain regions of the brain more than others. Mm -hmm. And no one's really ever been able to understand that. Why would it affect, you know, the cerebral temporal cortex, but not so much the occipital cortex? And why does it affect the posterior cingulate cortex and not the anterior or, and not the anterior cingulate cortex? And so it's sort of been a mystery, right? So it turns out that when that, that, that this foraging response that's driven by fructose. So when you give fructose to an animal, they start foraging for food. Okay. Now foraging you know, and if you give sugar to your kid, you'll see that they get hyperactive and they're running around and they're often Are you hungry. Are to the wandering behavior in Alzheimer's? Yeah, well, we're going to get there, actually. I'm, I am taking you there. But, but okay. this, is actually, this is actually sort of uh, more dramatic, what I'm going to tell you. So, okay. so what happens is, um, so there's certain regions of the brain that tend to be affected by Alzheimer's and others that are not. And fructose also tends to affect certain regions of the brains and, and others not so much. So it turns out that foraging is where it's at. So the foraging behavior initiated by fructose requires certain behaviors. You have to, you have to be able to wander into areas and look around. You have to keep moving. You can't deliberate. You have to look and make quick decisions you can't have a lot of self-control because you've got to go into areas that are dangerous. And if you have too much self-control, you don't want to go into the lion's den because you know you might get hurt. But here you have to have kind of that impulsivity, that bravery to, to go and do things sort of dangerous because you, when you're foraging, you have to find food even in areas where there may be predators. So you have to be you know, you have to be strong and brave and impulsive. So it turns out that that a lot of our brain is to help 
is to reason and self-control. And so it turns out that when you, dr you drink fructose, if you give fructose to a person, you can show that immediately there's a decrease in blood supply to certain regions of the brain that are involved in self-control. And hmm. those are the insulin sensitive areas like the cortex and like the hippocampus where it tries to block recent memory. It doesn't want you to remember how dangerous it was last time you were here. You know, so uh, so it turns out that things like the hippocampus, which is the recent memory, mm -hmm. certain regions of the brain are inhibited by fructose. They become insulin resistant. ATP levels fall. And uh, and whereas there are other areas like the occipital cortex, which is really important for like seeing food and identifying visual visual cues, they call it, where you see a delicious cake, your eyes quickly focus on it. That's the visual cortex that that increases with blood flow when you get fructose. And, mm. and there's another for, there's a foraging center called the anterior cingulate and it blood flow goes up there, you know, when you, when you eat fructose and guess what? In Alzheimer's, the disease affects those areas where fructose inhibits that area of the brain. So like the cortex, the hippocampus, it's like a perfect match. And the areas where fructose stimulates uh, blood flow for foraging, like the anterior cingulate, that is, uh, you know, preserved in, in Alzheimer's. It's like one of the last sections ago. So we know that, the, you know, no one's ever been able to map it, but here mm -hmm. we got it. And it's a foraging response. That's and so what we know, so what we know is that when the more sugar you eat, the more fructose you make, the more these areas are going to, you know, have their energy go down, become insulin resistant, the, the less fuel. So it, it makes sense that those are the areas that start to atrophy, start to have neuronal dropout. And, uh, and that's where the disease develops. So man, so many follow-ups. So that would imply to me that uh, the damage by the time I'm symptomatic, it's too late and going to a low sugar, low carb diet is probably not going to make that much difference for me if I'm already symptomatic. Is that correct? No, you know what? I think that if you start having early memory problems, it, you're still at a stage where you where you can really be, you know, helped. And I think that diet is probably the best route to go. Um, and uh, and actually probably the very best are, are like the low carb diets and the mm -hmm. keto diets. And there, there are groups that are, are looking at this right now. There's been some really surprising and exciting results. And, and I, you know, I think that, um, there's a lot of hope. There's also, you know, if you read in my book, uh, nature wants us to be fat. I, I have a copy here. I go through all the foods that actually counter this pathway. There are foods that counter this pathway. I mean, like drinking water can be beneficial, believe it or not, because it suppresses some of this vitamin C, um, you know, healthy vegetables and, and, uh, you know, Natural fruits actually don't have that much fructose and they carry things like vitamin C and epicatechin and all these really interesting right, yeah. compounds that, that can actually counter these effects. So I think that a healthy diet trying to reduce junk food can have a fantastic effect. Now, if you're, if your brain's already, you know, I mean, if you get a CT scan and you've, yeah. the brain has shrunk a lot, it may not grow back so much, right. but you can, you might be able to stop it from progressing and you can still probably have a great life. I am, I am fascinated by this. So, uh, this would speak to me about some benefit from intermittent fasting. If intermittent fasting is going to break that cycle in my body, is that where you're heading as well? Does that look yeah. positive to you? Oh, absolutely. Intermittent fasting is another fantastic way uh, to, to kind of turn the, this system off. Keto diets are low, you know, paleo diet, you know, paleo diets are, I mean, there's lots of potential approaches. And I actually also think that you can have a, a diet that involves, you know, like a Mediterranean diet can mm -hmm. be quite good. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my book, I actually put together all these foods that I think are healthy and and so if you're interested, you can get that and you, you don't have to be on just a strict low carb diet. But, you know, there are so many places we can help. Um, and, you know, one one rule that I like is to drink a glass of water before each meal, because we can show that high salt 
diets can activate this pathway in the brain. So when you eat really salty foods, as well as sugary foods, these are the two main triggers that kind of turn this on, this switch on. And, uh, and if you drink water and you cut back on high glycemic carbs and, and sugar and salt, just, you know, just cut it back. I think you'll, you'll see an improvement. You'll see an improvement. Uh, I am, our time is gone today, but I am, I'm so interested in having you back again to learn more about your book and, and yeah. all of those factors. I think it's important that we talk about that. So I hope that yeah. you will. I hope that you'll come back. Thank you, Lee. It was really fun being on your show. And I, I wish the very best to your audience that there's, I think Alzheimer's should be a preventable disease. Man, I love the thought of that. Don't we all? Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.